Now, I could grumble about everything that happened, or I could sing God's praises. I chose God's praises. Tonight, we're going to take a look at Numbers 21, verses 1 through 18. Um, if anybody needs a Bible, if you don't have one, uh, we have Bibles there in the back. I'll get one of the guys to give you out. Anybody? Raise your hand. Everybody good? Everybody good? Excellent. Now, this passage takes place as the Israelites have been wandering in the desert for 40 years. They finally come to the edge of the promised land, and they're preparing to enter. They've seen God's miracles again and again and again. Everything from the exodus from Egypt to the parting of the Red Sea, the wellspring of water as it came and gushed out of a rock, the manna and the quail, God's provision provided to them so they would not starve out in the desert. So as they reach the edge of the promised land, do you think that they were happy? Or do you think that they whined and complained? The title of this message is Grumble, or sing. Would you pray with me? Precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, and Jesus, we need you to come here and fill this room. We need you to fill our hearts. And Lord, as the Israelites went out, and as they grumbled, even after seeing all of your amazing miracles, God, we fall prey to that as well. So, Lord, as we go through the scripture tonight, as we go through your word, I pray that if there's anything here that you want us to learn, please, Lord, etch that, etch that scripture in our hearts. But, Lord, if there's anything of man, I pray, Lord, or if it's just from me, that it would fall on deaf ears. God, we can't thank you enough for the blessings given. Lord, every breath that we have, every heartbeat that we have, let it not be wasted. To you be all the glory. Thank you, Jesus. And it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So, starting off in verse 1, Numbers 21. The king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelled in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road to Arathim. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. Now, I like this. Deliver them, then totally destroy them. Sounds like win-win to me, doesn't it? <laughs> right? So, don't you wish we could do this? You're traveling down the 330. That person that's been tailgating you, okay, all the way to the middle pass, okay, then he goes ahead and he speeds past you, he salutes at you and waves with only one finger, then cuts you off, and then continues down, right? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just go, Lord, please, just have this guy fall over the side, and you know what, I'll make sure that his car is so damaged, he never, this idiot never drives again. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Win-win. <laughs> no, but it's almost the analogy that I, when I read this, I think about it, I'm like, hey, this is good. This is a good deal. Hey, give them to us. Yeah, we'll take care of it for you, Lord, okay? So why is this an important part of this scripture? Why is this significant? Well, first of all, it would be the, one of the first times that Israel's military victories against the Canaanite would come by an unprovoked attack from King Aaron. Israel fought valiantly, and God fought with them. Now, as we continue to read throughout their uh, conquest, throughout the uh, promised land, is that always what happens? No, we see it again and again, right? When they go out and try to do their own thing, not God's will, but their will, it usually doesn't go very well. And I think the same thing happens when we try to do things on our own, in our own lives. You see, we try to make things happen. We try to do things on our own and we fail. But when we go to God, when we pray, and when we seek his will, God will fight for us too. You see, I think too many people think of God's will as a single dot, right? Oh, well, if I could just figure out what God's will was. God's will isn't a dot. 
It's a giant circle. And so, for example, if here it is, my son decides to grow up and become a doctor, can God use that to accomplish his will? Yes. What if my son decides to be a garbage man? Can he accomplish God's will? Yes. What if he wants to be a preacher like his father? Yes. You see, all of those things are within that circle of God's will. So when we're seeking God's will, remember, it's not that point. It is truly so much more, and he can use it for his good. Amen? All right. Let's see what God does with his people. Verse 3. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So the name of that place was called Harath. So we're praying, if we're praying, and we're keeping his commandments, and we're seeking his will, God is good to deliver us from our enemies. Now, it's interesting because uh, horma, I, I said haram before, excuse me, horma means broken rock or banned or devoted to destruction. Appropriate, don't you think? But I would say that any time that we say, that which is pagan in my life, that which is blatant sin, this I'm going to destroy. Why? Because I want my son, I want my daughter, I want my neighbor, my fellow worker set free from the captivity of sin. You see, we can be such a witness to those around us if we would only walk in his ways. God gave Israel the victory, and this victory was the beginning of that of Israel's triumphant march into the promised land. Verse 4. Then they joined from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. The soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Now, the Israelites go around Edom, uh, the land of Edom. So first that begs the question, why? Well, it was necessary. Turn back with me, if you will, to Numbers 20, starting in verse 14. Numbers 20, verse 14 through 21. And it says, Now Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, You know all the hardships that has befallen us, how our fathers went down to Egypt, and we dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians afflicted us and our fathers. When we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent the angel and brought us up out of Egypt. Now, here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your border. Please, let us pass through your country. We will not pass through fields or vineyards, nor will we drink water from wells. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. Then Edom said to him, you shall not pass through my land, lest I come out against you with the sword. So the children of Israel said to him, We will go by the highway, and if our livestock and drink any of your water, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. Then he said, You shall not pass through. So Edom came out against them with many men and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory, so Israel turned away from him. So you can see here, the Israelites are being respectful. And if you think about it from the king's perspective, here it is. Is he talking about a band of 25 people that's just going to walk through his town? No, we're talking, right? We're talking hundreds of thousands, maybe even over a million of the Israelites. That's a lot. Do you think that that's going to leave just a little bit of a footprint? <laughs> I would think so. So from a very earthly perspective, I could understand why the king would go ahead and deny them access, even the children of Israel. But God's got a plan in it all. So Edom lines up its army and it says, nope, not today. Israelites go around. And they're happy to do so, right? No. No. <laughs> Because it says there in the verse, it says, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Now, this is important. Where is your soul? 
Which brings me to my first point. Are you praising God or discouraged by your surroundings? You see, when we're in bad situations, I would say first we need to ask ourselves, is this where I'm supposed to be? If you're sitting with a bunch of your friends at a bar, drinking and doing drugs, you have to ask yourself, is this where God wants me? Probably not. Second, when we get into bad situations, when God allows bad things to happen to good people, our focus needs to not be on the problem, but we instead need to focus, our focus needs to be up. Can I get an amen? You see, I've seen those Christians who walk around discouraged, still saved, but living a miserable life. I've seen rich individuals that have everything, yet still miserable. And the reverse, those that are poor, dirt floors, and happy outside of their circumstances. People, we have a choice. The Israelites were choosing discouragement. Oh, Egypt was so good. The bread there, the spices. But yet how quick were they to forget the lashes and the sting of the enemy's whips in slavery and look back to the good old times that weren't always so good, were they? Verse 5. And the people spoke out against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this, loathes this worthless bread. Now, a couple of things here, okay? Number one, there's no food and water, and our souls loathe this worthless bread? No food? Was there? Yes. No water? Remember, Moses struck the rock. And a spring. They had a holy spring to drink from. Worthless bread? Manna? Really? Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verses 24 and 25. In verse 24, it says, Had rained down manna on them to eat and given them the bread of heaven. The bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. They were eating the food of angels. You might even say, angel food cake. <laughs> Right? Now, something interesting here. There is never any reference to the Israelites ever having a problem with their feet. But yet they walked every day, miles and miles and miles. And there's no historical reference or anything in the Bible that says that their feet were swollen. Hmm. You know, sweet feet being swollen is actually an indicator of some medical problems, things that, that are going wrong. Um, nowadays, it's, it, I find it fascinating because obviously I've seen lots of doctors lately, but they'll go ahead and they, and they check the capillary refill. They'll check your nails and they're like, oh no, you don't, let's see, uh, you don't have any signs of, of diabetes. And I'm like, you just look at my fingernails, you know? What if I had nail polish on or something, you know? But uh, um, anyway, right? But they do these things. And yet here it is, no swollen feet is one indicator that they were not lacking any nutrition. Amazing. Amazing. The Israelites walked thousands of miles while eating a well-balanced diet. Never had foot problems. Thus, they were tired of the very food that was perfect for them. You know, it's funny because my kids will ask uh, or say a lot of times that they are allergic to green. Anything green. 
So a lot of times my wife has to go ahead and blend our vegetables up. <laughs> and sneakily they get in there and they get what's perfect for them. Now, have you ever asked yourself, what does manna represent? I believe it's a representation of Jesus. In John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And when Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread in our Lord's Prayer, I believe it's a reference to manna, meaning that we are to trust God to supply us our physical needs one day at a time, just as the Jews did out in the desert. Yet the Israelites, they still grumbled. To all of my parents out there, when your kids grumble, how does that make you feel? Does it make you feel happy? Does it make you feel, wow, I really want to go ahead and reward my kids? Or, well, if you were Nellie Olson from Little House on the Prairie, you'd probably get rewarded. I know, dating myself there. But let's see what our Lord did with his kids. Verse 6. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among his people, and they bit at the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Have you ever sent fiery serpents to your kids? <laughs> I think tase, tasing them is probably the farthest I've ever gone with, with my kids. Um, you, you know, just recently, just recently, uh, Connie got the hiccups, right? So she's doing the hiccups, and I said, you know, I go, I can cure them. I can get rid of them. Do you want me to get rid of the hiccups? And she was like, yeah, yeah, da uh, yeah Dad, please, please get rid of the hiccups. So I'm like, okay, hang on one second. I'm going to go get, get my taser. And she's like, no, no. <laughs> What? And I said, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. Oh, look, here's yellow. Okay, old yellow. He's good, he's good. He said, ah! No, no, Dad, please, please don't taste me. Please don't taste me. I go, it's okay. And just like I heard in the hospital a million times, it's only going to pinch. So I'm walking towards her with the taser. She's just about coming to tears. And I'm all, how are your hiccups? All gone. <laughs> Right, so you boo, right, do that, you scare somebody, and the hiccups go away. Well, I used my little yellow taser in order to accomplish the same thing. Same thing. Now, Connie might have thought that this was a terrible thing, but I meant it for good. <laughs> now, as we take a deeper look into the scriptures, okay, um, hopefully, I'd like to clear up some confusion. Now, notice what it says here. It says, so the Lord sent fiery serpents. Interesting. So does evil come from God? No, no, only good. And I think that this is where some people get confused. And you've even heard some people say, oh, God is punishing me, right? But what does James 1.17 say? It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. You see, only good comes from God, which brings us to our second point. Only good comes from God. Okay, Adam, so if only good comes from God, then was God judging the Israelites? Well, Romans 14, 4 says, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Eternal judgment is God's and God's alone. No, he's not judging, but let's look again at some more scripture. It says, the Lord sent fiery serpents. Why would God send serpents if he's good? Well, let's take a look at Hebrews 12, 6. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. I've heard people say that the Lord of the Old Testament and the Lord of the New Testament are actually two different gods. 
And you see, now we have a covenant with that new God, right? We have a covenant with Jesus, so much so that he washed away all of our sins and we're forgiven and we can do no wrong. Uh, yes, and a resounding no. You see, where are our sins? All of our sins, past, present, and future, nailed to the cross with the perfect sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Yes. But does that mean there are not consequences for our sins? No. If I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I ask him into my heart, repent, and ask forgiveness of my sins, will I be saved? Yes. And the eternal war reward is heaven. However, if I sin after accepting Jesus, does that mean that there will not be consequences? No. God will still allow fiery serpents our way for correction and discipline. Let me say that again. God will allow those things for correction and discipline. Does that make sense? All right. You see, let me give you an analogy. If I say speed down the highway at 100 miles an hour and get pulled over, and I say, I'm a police officer. I know how to go this fast. I can go now. Do you think there's going to be consequences to my actions? Yes, most definitely, okay? Now, will I no longer be a police officer? No. No. I still will. I will still have all the privileges and responsibilities of carrying that badge and a gun. But there will be the consequences also. The fine of the ticket and guaranteed a strong reprimand from either my sergeant or captain. Maybe even so much so that I get written up and a strong reprimand for breaking the law, which I'm supposed to be upholding. So yes, we are still Christians when we sin. No, we're not going to lose our salvation. And yes, there are still consequences for our sins. Let's bring it back to the passage. It says in verse 6, So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Adam, it says the people died. That's kind of harsh, don't you think? You see, pain... The pain of the venom drove the people to repent. Plus, God will always provide a way out, won't he? Let's read on. Verse 7. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. What was the first thing Moses did? He prayed for the people. Then why is it that that's usually the last thing we do, right? Here it is. The doctor says you have cancer. Well, you know what? I'm going to go to chemotherapy. Jen and I were just talking about this. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to eat right. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to go ahead and find out as much about that cancer as possible so that I can go ahead and beat these things. What's the problem with all of those statements? Yeah, it's all about me, isn't it? It's all about I. Now, I'm not saying that these things are bad. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do them. But what should be the first thing we do? It's to be just like Moses and pray. Verse 8, Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent. Set it on a pole. It shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. You see, the Lord gives a way out, doesn't he? And the Lord didn't just say, that's it, I'm done with you. You're grumbling again. Fiery serpents for you all. Death is your reward. No, no. God goes ahead and he provides that way out. But notice, it requires a small bit of work on their parts, doesn't it? 
Yes. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now, it doesn't say that they had to recite all the Levitical laws, find a goat, sacrifice it, say 50 Hail Marys, and then they'll be saved? <laughs> no, right? All it says is if they looked at the bronze serpent, they lived. Now, you see, God doesn't give us a laundry list of things that we need to do for our salvation either, does he? <coughs> no, we merely have to repent, ask for forgiveness of our sins, ask Jesus into heart, and make him Lord of our life. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? If they look at that which hung on the pole, they would be saved. Do you see it? Do you see the symbolism? Now, it's interesting because when we think of a pole, what do we think of? We think of like a flagpole, right? We think of here it is, right? It's got a truck on the top of it. By the way, official military term of the ball on top of a flagpole. It's called a truck. Um, right? And the flag waving and everything. That's what we think of as a pole. But now, let's think back to like the Crusades or the Middle Eastern or Middle Eastern times. <laughs> Middle Ages times, right? Here it is. They'd march into banners and, or march into, into battle with the banners. They'd be carrying a pole with the cross and their colors upon them. Are we getting closer? I think so. Well, that which hung to the pole, if they looked at it, they would be saved. Can you see the symbolism? Now, this is what I love about Wednesday night. This isn't a, a Sunday service. We get to unpack. We're going to delve deeper into this. We're going to look and see exactly what the Lord was talking about when he told Moses to do this, okay? So, this is a representation of Jesus. Tanner mentioned it a few Sundays ago, and he just kind of touched on it. We're going to totally break it down tonight. So, Moses goes ahead and he makes this brass serpent. He puts it on a pole and it came to pass that as the people were bitten by the snakes, they would look upon the brass serpent and they would be healed. They would live. So God gives an interesting foreshadowing of the cross and Jesus Christ. The serpent is always a symbol of sin because Satan came in the form of a, of a serpent in the Garden of Eden, Right? Brass is always a symbol of judgment. The serpent was made of brass. Now, is there symbolism all throughout the Bible? Yes, right? I mean, think about it. Here it was, the, uh, the wise men, the magi, they gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh to Jesus, right? Yeah, they brought him those things. Why do you think they brought those three things? Well, let's see. The offerings are really good this month, so we've got a couple of extra gold bars. We'll throw those in for the Jesus, uh, the Christ, and then we'll go ahead and, uh, let's see, let's see, frankincense. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's in a manger. Oh, it's going to be smelly there, so that'll be good. That'll kind of, uh, oh, you know, uh, mask over the odor. And let me see, where's some oregano? He'll love it on pizza. Oregano, oregano, nope, nope, we're out of that. Oh, this myrrh will do. Is that, is that why? No. They were symbolic. They represented things about Christ. They gave him the gold. Why? Because he was a king. He was the king of kings. And gold was something that kings had. They gave him the frankincense. Why? Because that was an incense that they would burn inside of the temples. And the smoke going up was representative of the people's prayers going up to heaven. And they gave him myrrh. Why? Because myrrh was a spice that was used in basically like the embalming, the preparing of the body after it was dead, showing that Christ was going to die. You see, it wasn't an accident, those things, and it wasn't an accident that brass was used of the snake. Brass is that symbol of judgment. The, the, the serpent was made of brass, and as such... Um, Okay, so Adam, you said it twice so far, okay? Brass is the symbol of judgment, okay? Where do you find that? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let's go ahead and we'll look in two places. Yes? Did I say brass? 
I did say brass. I wrote it down wrong. It's bronze. Yeah, yeah. Okay, bronze. Bronze represents. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I, I'm right. I'm right. It's brass. Brass, bronze. Okay, there we go. There we go, right? Stop reading out of the King James Version. <laughs> okay? So, open up to Judges verses 16, uh, excuse me, Judges 16, verse 21. Now, in this scripture, you have the very strong correlation between the subject of judgment or justification and the biblical use of the metal brass. Remember Samson, right? Strongest man in the Bible, okay? Judges 16, 21. But the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. See, Samson played around with the gifts that God gave him and ended up being imprisoned and judged by the Philistines. Let's look at 2 Kings, verses 25, verse 7. Excuse me, uh, chapter 25, verse 7. And they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. They put out his eye, the eyes of Zedekiah. They like putting out eyes, don't they? I guess it's a Middle Eastern thing. And bound him with fetters of brass and carried him to Babylon. We see that brass and judgment go together. So let's look back at our brass serpent. They confessed, we have sinned. The brass serpent on the pole was that symbol that your sin has been judged. Now, if you'll just look at the brass serpent, the place where your sin was judged, you'll be healed. Later on in Hezekiah's day, the people made this brass serpent. The people that had made this brass serpent, they kept it, and it was an interesting artifact. And they kept it, and they took it on journeys and into the land. And the judges and the kings all throughout this period kept this brass serpent. And at the time of Hezekiah, uh, when he was king over Judah, the people were worshiping this brass serpent. They had made it an idol. They were covering it and offering prayers before it, worshiping the brass serpent. Now, what does it indicate when a person begins to worship an idol? Well, number, yes, number one, it indicates that that person has lost conscious of the living God's presence. I'm no longer a conscious living God present with me. Thus, I'm looking for something that will remind me of that presence. And so, I can get some little kind of reminder, a memento, some kind of an image or whatever I can to remind me of God's presence. But the fact that I need an object shows that I've lost consciousness of the presence of God. And number two, it indicates that somehow deep inside, I'm longing for that which I have lost. I'm longing for a meaning relationship with God. I'm longing for something that can bring my attention back to the fact of God's presence. And thus, it's a signal. It should be a signal to every one of us of a spiritual deterioration and degradation inside of us. Now, it's interesting because Hezekiah ends up going on and taking that brass, uh, brass snake. He breaks it into pieces, and he says, Noshwas, dummies. It's not a god. Noshwas means thing of brass. It's not a god, and he breaks all of the pieces. You know what happened to those pieces? They kept them. Somebody found them, went ahead, and today you can go ahead and go to St. Ambrose Cathedral in Milan, Italy, and you can see the glued together pieces of brass. And you can see the people going up, offering their prayers, kissing the glass cover, because according to their story, those were now... Uh, <laughs> They, they, they did it all over again. If we don't know our history, what are we doing? Damn to repeat it, right? Yes. Noise wash. But more important, right? It's just brass. In the New Testament, Jesus tells us of the true significance and clarity for this brass serpent lifted up on a pole. Turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 3, verses 1 through 15.
John chapter 3, 1 through 15. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say this to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but, I, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered, said to him, You are a teacher of Israel, and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Now here's the kicker, verse 14. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's how we know a person is born again, by looking to the Lord Jesus Christ as he was lifted up on the cross, and we see there, God has judged my sins. Jesus bore the judgment of God for my sins. As the brass serpent was a symbol of sin being judged, it was looking forward to God's judging man's sins upon the cross. And God laid upon him the iniquities of all of us, and he bore the sins of the world, that God judged the sins of the world on the cross of Jesus Christ. And now you, who are dying because of this deadly affliction called sin, all you have to do to live is to look to the cross of Jesus Christ and see that God has judged your sin and believe in him. Verse 10. Now the children of Israel moved on and camped in Obah, and they journeyed from Obah to the and camped at E.J. Araman in the wilderness, which is east of Moab, towards the sunrise. From there they moved and camped in the valley of Zered. From there they moved and camped to the other side of Arnon, which is in the wilderness that extends from the border of the Amorites, for the Arnon is the border of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. The Israelites went around the region of Edom, and they entered into the territory of Moab. This was just east of Jericho. This would be their new staging area for the conquest of the Promised Land. Your time is up, God says to his friend Moses. It's time for you to, gather to be gathered to your people, to be taken to heaven. But first, I want you to climb Mount Nebo, where I will show you the Promised Land. In this, we see both the grace and the discipline of God. God's grace allowed Moses to view the promised land. But because he had sinned in misrepresenting God to the people as he struck the rock at Meribeth, which we see in Numbers 20, verse 11, he would not be able to enter it. Now, the older I get, the more I realize that although God is full of mercy grace. He is a father who is patient and kind. There are definite, absolute repercussions for sin. Which brings me to our third point. 
God is full of mercy and grace, but there are definite and absolute repercussions for sin. This is why the Bible says, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9, verse 10. We ought to walk in the fear of God, not afraid of him, but afraid of the repercussions of sin. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Verse 14. Therefore, it is said in the book of wars of the Lord, Wahab in Surha, the brook of Arnon, and the slope of the brooks that reaches to the dwelling of Ar and lies on the border of Moab. The book of the word, War of the Lord refers to an early collection of songs and writings that we only know about because of this passage. There's not a copy of the book. And why do you think that there's not a copy of this book? Because God did not think that it was necessary to have that book so well preserved as he would the rest of our Bible. Verse 16. From there, they went to beer. Okay, it, they didn't get a beer. Okay, they went to beer. Okay, <laughs> yay, we won. Woo-hoo. No, 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 they went to beer. It's a place. <laughs> Which is the well where the Lord said to Moses, gather the people together and I will give them water. Then Israelite, Israel sang this song. Spring up, O well. All of you sing to it. The well, the leaders sang sank, dug by the nation's nobles, by the lawgiver with their staves. The children of Israel sang and water gushed forth. I don't want you to grumble about your situation. I want you to sing. But why don't we? But Adam, you never grumble. (laughs) Yeah, Adam grumbles. Oh, I know, say it isn't so. Remember the visit with Doc Bramson? Mm -hmm. Remember me being in the hospital? Remember picking the arm, two weeks antibiotics? Was I happy with all that? No. I grumbled. So this busy guy was doing something. He was looking for work. He didn't want to stay home. Don't grumble. Sing. Which brings me to our last and our final point. When we come to dry times and difficult situations in our life, we can either choose to grumble or make music. Sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not labored with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. And that's Isaiah 54, 1. Are you barren? The Lord's ass, you or me. I don't want you to grumble about your situation. I want you to sing out. Seen throughout the word of God, that whenever people are in barren places, whenever they're in dry times, whenever they're locked in cells, power and blessing are poured out when they choose not to grumble, but instead... Praise the Lord. The children of Israel did this, and water gushed out. They moved on. How about you? Grumble or sing? The choice is yours. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I want to sing your word. I want to sing your song. Lord, I want to sing it when I'm in church with you and doing worship. I want to sing it when I'm at home in front of my children to be that witness for them. I want to sing it when I'm at work. I want to sing it when I'm in the car. I want to sing it when I'm having one of the most lousiest days of my life. God, I don't want to grumble. And I know the flesh, my flesh, Lord, is weak, but you are strong. And with you, Lord, I can accomplish great and mighty things. So, dear Jesus, I pray that you would be with each and every one of us, that you would be our strength. And when we get into those hard times, Jesus, we're going to sing. We're going to sing. Thank you, Jesus. Know that we love you. 
we bless you. And it's in your precious name that we sing. Amen.